In the previous video, we talked about normalization of gene expression values using global scaling normalization. In this video, we cover another method called SC transform. So you will learn when SC transform performs better than the global scaling normalization, how it works, what analysis steps it's able to take care of, and what you need to remember in the subsequent analysis steps if you have normalized with SC transform. So just to remind you, the number of UMIs per cell varies significantly between cells and hence gene expression values can also vary even if the actual gene expression level was the same. So normalized gene expression values should be independent of sequencing depth or the num total number of UMIs per cell. Now, Sarah's default method is global scaling normalization, which simply divides genes UMI count by the total number of UMIs in that cell. It then multiplies the ratio by a scale factor, which is 10,000 by default, and log transforms the result. This works okay for genes that are expressed at low to medium levels, but for high expressing genes, the normalized values still correlate with sequencing depth. And they also show disproportionately high variance in cells with low sequencing depth. So we need an alternative, and the Serat people developed SC transform. It models gene expression as a function of sequencing depth using generalized linear model. It constrains the model parameters through regularization by pooling information across genes which are expressed at similar levels. The actual normalized expression values are Pearson residuals from this regularized negative binomial regression. And this seems to work very well. So here we have three, three sets. On the left, we have unnormalized data. So genes have been grouped based on their expression levels. High expressors are marked with uh, dark brown, light expressors with light yellow. And you can see the relationship. So when the cell's total UMI count rises, also the uh, gene UMI counts go up. If we perform global scaling normalization, we manage to get rid of that uh, correlation in the case of low to medium expressing genes. But for high expressing genes, we still have this uh, line going up. Instead, after SC transform, we actually managed to deal also with the medium expressing and high expressing genes, and it's only the really high expressing ones that still have a problem. This image is from the paper by Hafemeister et al., uh, where you can also read more detailed description of this method. SC transform can actually perform various steps, so it not only normalizes the expression values, but it also identifies highly variable genes, scales data, and regresses out unwanted variation. Uh, you find ST transform in Chipster in, in this tool, and the parameters down here are relevant for ST transform part of this tool. So number of variable genes to return, and whether you want to regress out cell cycle differences. So if you use SC transform, you can afford to change some parameters in this and subsequent steps. So as we already saw in normalization and finding highly variable genes, you can afford to go up to 3000 instead of the usual 2000. In the principal component analysis, you can compute more principal components. And in clustering, of course, depending on your actual case, you might want to use higher number of principal components and higher resolution. So why do we use these higher numbers when the data has been normalized with SC transform? 
Well, because SC transform does a better job in normalization, so the variation in sequencing depth is not a confounding factor anymore, then additional variable features are less likely to be driven by technical differences across the cells, and instead they may represent more subtle biological variability. So SC transform is particularly well suited for situations when you are looking for cell types which have only very small differences uh, between themselves and you need to separate them.